Miracles remove the human out of it. Hey everybody, we're here with another new episode of Unrefined Podcast, and this is your host Brandon and my co-host Lindsay. Hey guys, yeah, one of our early guests back today, really excited to get into it. Yeah, and and our our guest today is Steve Harmon, he's a friend of the show, he's been on it before, and uh, we're going to... He, he does ministry everywhere, you guys. He is a, a ministry machine, and I mean that in a good way, not a pejorative way. He... He just listens to the Holy Spirit. Of of, all, of a lot of the Christian guys that I know, I really admire his hearing and obeying skills, which I think that's what the Bible basically comes down to, trust and obey. And he does it, and he puts it into real action in his life. And so I want to welcome you, Steve, to the show. This is your casa, your house. You're in our living room, and we want to have a conversation with you about, obviously, about a few things, but also whatever the Holy Spirit leads us to, to talk about. Um so, can you give us kind of an update of uh, a small update of about what you've been up to? Well, thanks for having me. Um, I've been up here in Canada and trying to move the needle for more kingdom and to equip and invigorate believers to walk in their identity, walk in their calling. And so, um, I, I love it. Um, I like I kind of go under the radar. I don't tell a lot of people what I do unless they start asking personal questions. Um, but I just let God direct me wherever I'm supposed to be and who I'm supposed to talk to, and and the, the opportunities open themselves, and I just take them mm-hmm. and and minister however I can. I serve, you know. It's all about being a servant. So sometimes I'll be doing worship, and that'll be my open door to get in. And then once I start doing worship more, then um, we start talking and then they want me to teach or something like that. So, so yeah, I mean, however, however God puts me in a position, I am going to serve and utilize it to help influence. That's always my goal. Yeah, yeah Steve, I really love that um, just idea of flying under the radar, but still being very deliberate at the same time. It, it seems like that's what you're doing. And- that's always been a difficult balance for me to strike, and I and I and I'm, I'd ask you how do you do it, but it, it I mean, being led by the Spirit is most yeah. of what it comes yeah. down to. I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah, because you're just wanting to you're wanting to influence, and you you know that like even if you're in a type of church, like maybe a Baptist type church that maybe would not be open to the gifts. There's there's the gifts of the Spirit. Um, there's ways of how I will approach it to where I'm not super offensive or super off their grid where they will close down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I try to meet people wherever they're at and speak to them wherever they're at to move, but to, but find out where they're at and then move them forward more, move them forward more, move them forward more where they're at. Mm-hmm. But if you do it to extreme, you give them too much stuff, then they shut down and they, you're all her- heretical and all that stuff. So yeah, I mean, the, the, <laughs> you know, the old saying is true: you, you catch more bees with honey than with vinegar. And and I have a friend who basically this week was just telling me, look, when you're talking with someone, you know, don't ever attack like if they're if they're following a person and this person's doctrine, don't attack the person that they're following in their doctrine. Just ask them Socratic, you know, Socratic method. Ask them questions to 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 get them to think about what they're believing and and not attack like. Sure. You know, like whatever, per, like I follow John MacArthur. And so don't go in and, and which see, this is what I do. Even though I'm against logical fallacies, I'll go in and ad hominem attack about John MacArthur. Oh, he makes $10 million a year. What a, you know, that's kind of hypocritical about yeah. prosperity teachers and yeah. yeah and yeah. stuff like that. And that, it, that doesn't do any good. All it does is put people's hackles up and, and they get defensive and you, you'll never reach. Yep. Once they get defensive you know, and I've noticed on your Facebook post, you do a very, good gentle job of trying to persuade people you're firm and truthful but yet you're you i can tell that you really love them and you want them to get the truth it's not you being right it's you wanting to be in right relationship with them yeah 
Yeah, and and just think. It's just all about thinking. I'm. Uh, I had somebody where we were talking uh, beyond the post and, and like direct messaging and and uh, I mean, his. Yeah, some people you can tell are not going to really be open, and so in my mind, I'm always thinking just sow seeds into them. Just sow yep. seeds into them. I'm not going to convince yep. them. There's no way I'm going to convince them right yep. now. Um, it's just sow seeds into them and let them think and and have food for thought. And you you keep the conversation civil, you know, uh, because some people will never. I, human beings have the tendency to reject something based off of spite, <laughs> not based off of if it's true yes. or not. They just yes. they, they they'll reject it because they just didn't like you, <laughs> and mm. so the, anything associated with you, they are not gonna. Uh, agree to it, which is horrible logic, but it's what people tend to do. And, um, uh, but yeah, it is trying to get people to think so they can make their decisions. And I mean, uh, I, you don't want to, it's not about trying to win an argument, right. never trying to win right. an argument. It's just about to get in your points for people to go back and think about it. And it, and it could take months years for them to come around but just as long as it's in there god can use it the holy spirit can use it to uh get the person to uh to sway on their beliefs because we do need to change in our beliefs it's just it, it is what it is because yeah uh, we need to have fruit and people don't use fruit as a gauge of of if you're holding on to truth so oh yeah totally i mean i, I was just lamenting this morning in in our circles there's there's a debate going on between the round earth and the flat earth. And I'm sitting here saying there are people dying, going to hell. Their souls are lost. You know, they need ministry. They need healing. And we're arguing about whether the earth is flat or round. Okay. Yeah. I'm just like, oh my gosh, talk about adventures and missing the point. And, 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 and I don't want to judge them because I mean, I don't want to definitely don't want to judge their hearts, but I was like, oh my goodness, can we just do what's important? And, and you're, you're exactly. doing the ministry of the kingdom and doing the ministry of the kingdom is what is important. So, uh, let me right. go, go ahead. Uh, can I yeah. piggyback off yep. of that? Just say, I, I have a post, but it was about Halloween and you know, every year you got the Halloween people just coming out and, and it's like their mission. This is what they're known for. This is their thing is to get Christians to don't do anything Halloween. My point is, is it's a, it's, it's a fearful thing where Christians run from it. They're afraid of it. They, uh, they're like, Oh my gosh, it's all the demonic stuff. And I, I put a disclaimer right in the beginning about people who have gone through satanic ritual abuse and that yes, Halloween definitely affects them because of, of, of the, the, the demonic power. And it's the high, uh, satanic day of the year and witchcraft. This is where they do the most rituals. I know all that. Um, and I would see, I witnessed to what it does. But what I'm trying to get Christians to understand is to look at it from a kingdom mindset. Don't run from everything just because there's some demonic aspect behind it. We shouldn't be running. We're supposed to be going towards and bringing light into something. <laughs> yep. And and so what Christians do is they like, oh, well, I'm going to turn my light off and I'm going to hide in my house and I'm not going to give those kids any candy. And that's going to show the demons. And it's like, <laughs> come on, seriously, you really think that that is you're, you're, you're creating this massive move against the demonic by doing that. No, come on. You're, you're, you're whispering the things that God shouts and you're shouting the things that God whispers. You're totally emphasizing on the wrong things. And, and, and the things that you need to really be focusing on is the kingdom and, and pe pulling people out of the darkness, not running from everything that the demonic brings towards you. And, and I was just giving ideas of what you could do on Halloween and how, uh, you know, if, if you're handing out ki candy to kids. They're coming to you. Mm. So there's so, much thing, so many things you can do to, to minister to people who are coming to you, whether it's their parents, teenagers. You can. I, I've I've heard awesome, cool stories about uh, people uh, ministering to trick or treaters and and tears flowing and mm. and God people being saved and and healed and things like that because they just thought kingdom. They didn't. They didn't go. Oh my gosh, this is this is just something where the demons are going to come out. And blah blah blah. I go. You can't get demons from trick or treating or handing out candy. It's the most ridiculous thing. I know. There's so many memes on it. So many. Uh, videos from ex Satanists on it, but you don't. I've never done a deliverance ever once. God has never brought up a, a time that a person needed deliverance from trick or treating as a kid. 
It's it's all for the things that the only time you, you're doing deliverance is for the things that a person has been abused by in their life and that they got into drugs and all of those things. Right. The only time you would ever need deliverance, anything related to Halloween is if you were a dumb kid and you went and did some sort of ritual with your fr friends yeah. because you thought it was funny and mm -hmm. cute and, and like playing with a Ouija board, then yes, you're going to need deliverance from yeah. that, but not from something as, as as minuscule as trick or treating, that doesn't create demonic power. I don't care what anybody says. Yeah. It's just Christians need to just not be afraid of this stuff. Go in full force. Don't get uh, yeah. Don't get bothered by um, that. This is a satanic holiday in a in, in a sense, and don't run from it. Use it and utilize it, and 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 push back against the enemy, but do it in the right way. Mm -hmm. And it just, just don't run from this stuff. And this, too many Christians are afraid of. Oh, Steve, and, and you mean you mean to tell me you don't hand out Jack Chick tracks in their in their bags? <laughs> <laughs> I used to live by where I used to live in Rancho Cucamonga, right down the street to where he actually uh, published all. Oh that. my oh, wow. gosh! <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I had to be funny there. I could see you. Here, here you go. Here's oh no, your... no, no! I knew a friend that worked for him. I knew a friend that worked for Jack Chick, and uh, it was just like uh, I, I I would try to get him away from all of that and he was just like yeah i gotta get all those traps uh, <laughs> oh man i found him in a mini a truck stop bathroom let me tell you <laughs> anyway yeah so so yeah. let's uh let's sure. this is all great stuff man I, i'm i'm even before we got started uh you know i'm i'm struggling with that too about how to communicate and, and talk with people about this kind of stuff and how to do it in a like i said um in a loving way without skating the truth. I don't, I don't want to become in, in a woke way, but at the same time, I, I do want to, uh, you know, be gentle and be caring and be loving. And I think a lot of that comes from, and we're going to get into this in our, in our show here in a second. A lot of that comes from just being there, just being present and being in proximity. And that's what I like about what you said about this whole Halloween thing. Yeah. We don't have to celebrate Halloween. But we can be in proximity with people who do, and we can be an influence. And that's yes. what matters. Use yep. the opportunity. Yep, yep. use the opportunity. Yeah. Well, today on our show, what we want to kind of tap into, unless the Holy Spirit takes us somewhere else, Steve, is we want to talk about the basics of an effective healing ministry, both physically and emotionally. But on this one, we kind of want to hone in on the physical stuff and your experience with mm -hmm. it, because I know for a while there you did it on the streets, and we do a lot of prayer walking with our discipleship stuff, and we do it too. And so I want to learn from you, like, what's an effective way to do that and what's an ineffective way to do that? And also, uh, you know, just diving into some emotional and tra traumatic type stuff and something that we can give our people out there some tools that they can do, like even across sitting across from somebody at a coffee shop or whatever. I'd love to um, pick your brain about that. So tell us about your journey with this whole healing experience. Well, I, I was always enamored with miracles. Yeah. And uh, I don't think there's a, a, I know there's no sin in that. No. <laughs> I no. think uh, uh, in certain groups of the Christian, uh, certain groups of the Christian world, uh, you, you, you get enamored with miracles and then you're in their mind, you've taken your eyes off of God and put it directly on yourself or something like yeah but that. steve they they get enamored with satan's miracles i mean in our circles the fringe they get more enamored with the yeah, occult they make a big deal. Yeah, yeah. yeah yeah anyway so keep going yeah so they'll make a big deal out of that um and then if there's any christian uh, if somebody's claiming for a christian healing then they'll always pivot to demons it's like as the demon is the one who does the healing and 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 yeah it's, it's just to trick you it's like oh god <laughs> Jesus help them. Yeah. Help them. Yeah. But if you if you really look at what's going on, what's going on is that you're dealing with the demonic. The demonic does not, absolutely does not want believers to move in power. And they do not want that power, that supernatural power to be released on the earth. They know it is the greatest, most great. The, the greatest of all forms of evangelism. Nothing comes close to it. Nothing, nothing rivals it. You know, you can go out on the street and you can argue with somebody if Jesus exists and all that, but you do a miracle, that'll just shut it all down. You don't have to do any of the arguing for five years with the atheist. You just tell them about, you just 
let them have an experience and encounter of God doing something powerful in their life. Why? Because miracles, miracles remove the human out of it. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so challenging to everybody. I mean, you, you again, you can go into a room and just talk about God and the existence of God and everybody will, you're not going to, all you're going to do is just start a big argument yeah. and everybody's going to have their or opinions. people's eyes just glaze over and they don't. <laughs> yeah. Glaze over. It's just it's all that. But all of a sudden in that art, in that room, that per, if there's a person in a wheelchair, you do a miracle right there. They get healed out of that wheelchair. Everybody is going to drop what they're doing, pay attention and listen now because something that wasn't human just happened. And so you're making, you'd made this argument. Well, they're going to want to know where it all came from. How did this happen? That's going to be the first thing that's going to come to their mind. How did this happen? I need to know. I need to know because my brain is frying mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. And then, then you have, you give them the explanation. It come, it came from God. And, and you said, Jesus healed them. And, and then they can't really dispute that because a, it just did happen. So without even having to argue with them, you're saying that Jesus is real. I mean, this is this is just how the logic is working. You're just saying Jesus is real by saying Jesus did that because you had a display that just happened and you attributed that display to Jesus. So now it's really challenging their mind and they're just going, their mind is just blowing away. So you have a captive audience at that moment more than anything you could really say. You have a... a you have a, a captive audience just because of that power. And so when you do that, uh, there's nothing greater, nothing greater to convince a person that God's real, nothing more powerful than displaying it. And, um, and, and, and some of the criticism that people would say when it would come, what I would hear when it would come to healing, they would just say, well, uh, God, he uh, or when you're healing people, you can make all the the attention on yourself. Mm. And I always point mm. out that in Acts three or Acts two, beggar at the gate, beautiful, he heals. They heal him right on the spot, right. and everybody is going, "How did how did this happen?" And they are thinking that they had power. And it only told, took one little sentence, one little sentence that they just said, "It's the Jesus, the Jesus Christ, the one you crucified. That's who did this." They're not arguing anymore now. It's not hard. It's not hard to fix that problem for them to think that you're the one that does this. It's not hard. You just tell them the, the, the common sense logic behind it, that it's him. And then now you have a captive audience and you can tell them all about this Jesus who just did the healing. You know, Steve, what I find inter interesting about that is, is when you're out in public and you do this with an unbeliever or, or a nominal believer, that they never question it's, whether it's Jesus or not. But it, it, it's only like in the Bible, the ones that say it's from Beelzebub are the religious authorities or those with a religious spirit, yes. you know? And, and, and I'm almost at the place to where I don't think that they can be reached unless a miracle takes place and that veil is pulled, like he says, and Paul says in Second Corinthians, that veil is pulled off their eyes. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's, it, it's they, they have this veil over their mind. And I mean... I think that there are things that I know I had a veil on over Me my too. over my eyes over the years because of just my pride and stubbornness and couldn't believe that I could be wrong on something. And with and with so, me, just plain ignorance. I've just had plain ignorance. You know, I didn't know any better. So yeah, yeah, pl plain ignorance. So there are uh, there are at least I would say three types of religious people out there. Yeah. The first two can be reached. The last one probably need a supernatural act of God yeah, to yeah. do it because there is so much that is being conveyed. And I think a lot of times that when you're, when you're trying to uh, talk to that super religious person, that religious person is so prideful. They're so stuck in their ways. You just can't even reach that in them. It's, it's, it's really hard. So all you can do is sow seeds. I think that's what Jesus did when he dealt with certain Pharisees. He just sowed these seeds yeah. and uh, would, would walk away and just said, here, this is what you got to do. You got to, you got to deal with your heart because it's hardened and you have uh, you have, it's all callous. Mm. That's, I mean, and he just walks away because he just gives them some food for thought and then leaves.
Well, look, it, even oh. even in Acts, when you had that more extreme circumstance where they're like, oh, the gods have come down. I mean, if you just read it, it clearly just didn't end Paul's healing ministry. He didn't say, oh, well, I'm done with healing. People think I'm a god. Even even in that extreme misunderstanding, he's, you still yeah. see him praying for people's healing afterwards. So it, it people are going to misunderstand things sometimes. You know? Mm. It, yeah. Good point. Yeah, they yeah. are. They are. They are. They're, they're going to misunderstand things. And that's why it's just, I mean, you get, pe- you, you get patient with people and, to explain some of this stuff. And um, uh, like I said, there's some people that are frustrated with what just happened, but you can tell they want to know. They want to know truth. Mm. But then there's other ones. They just, it's all from a wound on the inside. And they don't want to, uh, they don't want to be wrong. You know, I'm like, all right. Well, it may take time for that person. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Anyway, back on track. I'm sorry. We chased a rabbit. So finish telling us about your journey and healing and stuff. Yeah. So for me, I was, I was wanting to see God do miracles. I was wanting to see um, uh, God uh, transform lives. I wanted to see God just touch people in so many different ways. But uh, like I said, I wanted to see it with the miraculous too. And so I would just go after it and, and uh, I'd pray and I wouldn't see anything happen. It wasn't until I went to uh, Africa mm. that I started to see miracles. I started to see healing happen. And that like lit a fire under me because I went out there and um, I just was on the streets right when I got there. Like I woke up the next morning in the hotel there. And I just went out on the streets at six in the morning and I'm just wanting to preach the kingdom and wanting to pray for people. And I mean, in the streets of Malawi. Um, and, and yeah, I, uh, I, I, I would just see people get healed and it was, it was so surreal. I mean, it just lit a fire. Wow. In me. And that started back in 2008. And then I remember what, uh, hanging out with a friend he had a bad back and we prayed for his leg uh, to grow longer to the other or because he had a short leg and, and to even it up and so we prayed for that and he uh he, he got healed and then after that he was so lit on fire he was like can you please take me out and 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 show me this and so we went out the next day prayed for this muslim guy and the muslim guy got healed and without me even touching him. And I just pointed to his back and, and, and so he was like, I got to do this. I got to do this. And he just was obsessed about it after Mm. that and want to go out on the streets and pray for people and, and, and pray for healing and all that. So, uh, it, it, it started really from there. It started from there and we just started seeing it happen more and more as we began to, um, go out there every single day. Um, we would go into churches that didn't believe in healing. I remember going into a bookstore that and they didn't believe in healing and in this Christian bookstore. And we prayed for people in there. I think four people got healed in that bookstore. Wow. Mm-hmm. And then we posted it on Facebook. Cool. And one of the pastors who believed in power and healing, he was like, man, I, you, you guys went into the, the, the big mega church in, in the town and prayed for people and they got healed. They were like, yeah. He's like, man, you got to come over and hang out. And so we would just start to, um, um, we just start to pray uh, for people and see healing and, and that. It was just, it, it was just awesome. And then we connected with some other people and that was around the time I remember hearing about praying medic and, um, and then a couple other people, Tom Fisher, who I knew were doing street healing back then. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, yeah, but it was it was sporadic in different parts of the country, and um, yeah, and and then we 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 found another friend in San Diego that was doing it as well, and we started to have like um, uh, like healing clinics where we bring Christians in there, and we just teach them how to pray for healing, teach them how to how to uh, pray for people on the streets and all that, yeah. and yeah. Uh, and then we would go have some days where we'd all go out in groups and in little little pods and just praying for people and then come back and talk about the testimony. Yeah, see, we do 
We do this, Steve, with our ministry of discipleship making. It's called DMM, Discipleship Making Movements. And we prayer walk. And and we not only use uh, just praying for healing, but we also use the prophetic. We we ask if we can bless you and and then if they need it in their body or, or all that kind of stuff. But we we have tended, and I wanted to see what you thought about this, Steve. We have tended to only do it in certain areas. It's like we adopt an area. And we come in and we get to make relationships with these people like in an apartment complex or an area like that. And yeah. that way, when we pray for a healing, it goes around the apartment complex and we go back and we can follow up. And, and nice. I wanted to ask you about that. Nice. I'm sure you're about to get to that. But the, the, the follow up, it, it appears when you just kind of like drive by heal something, it, you know, it's, it's all, it can be ineffective. What do you think about that? Well, so like I call like just going out on the streets, I call it five and fly ministry. Yeah. Uh, and basically you're just dropping in seeds and, and giving people something to think about. Um, sometimes you can lead a person to the Lord, depending on where they are at. Right. Um, like some people are ready and they're like, yeah, I want Jesus. And, mm. and then there's other people that want to process the miracle because God doesn't always heal people who are ready to give their life to him. Yeah. Sometimes God is just wanting to, to show an act of love that I care for you. I love you. And and here's what I want to do, and, and just to prove to you. And so there's that. And then, um, uh, but but doing the more intricate relationship, that's where you're going to yield the most fruit mm. by putting the time into the person and and really uh, investing into them and giving answering questions because a lot of times the miracle is the is is the uh, hook to get them in there because really what you want to do is you want to renew their mind. You want to start tra challenging their thinking, getting them to understand who God really is and who they are to God. And the more you start doing that, the more it's going to really create the transformation. That's where, where we're really trying to have that end goal of of connecting with people. We want to connect with people that way. We want to get their mind to think. And if you can uh, invest into them and, and create relationship, especially, um, you know, you pray for people and not everybody's going to get healed right. because not every, and not everybody needs prayer for healing, but some people need prayer for something else. Yeah. Some th people just need relationships. Some people just need um, uh, to know that uh, they're, they're valuable. And uh, and God uses you to convey that to them in your relationship. So uh, I've ha I've done that many times with people in the past, where I would see the same person again, whether it's homeless person or uh, somebody who is down and out. They just don't have much much relationship with anybody, mm -hmm. and I just connect with them uh, as as frequently as I can mm -hmm. to really minister uh, the heart of God to them. And they, and then they start changing and then they want to. You know, that, that's one of the things that I've learned the most from you. I've learned a lot, but one of the things I've learned the most from you, from your Facebook stuff, from your teachings online, all that kind of stuff, is practice. That people seem to think, and particularly cessationists, reformed cessationists, you know, that whole crowd, that we ought to be able to just walk up there and it should work right away. And, and they don't realize that there is an avenue or an aspect of of practice and building your faith by seeing things happen. And I learned that from you, and that has made a huge difference. It's like I have a friend who says, keep doing what you're doing, you'll get better at it. And so I take what you talk about with practice with that keep doing what you're doing, you'll get better at it, and I won't give up. You know, I, I'm just going to bite down like a bulldog, and I'm not going to give up until— I see that certain person healed or, or until I see healing flowing more in my life. Yes. So will you go into that about yeah. practicing and what, what you, what, what you have to say about that? Yeah. Uh, practicing, uh, I think is just the backbone of how we're going to walk the Christian life. Christians don't look at it like that. They, they just either you do or, you're, or you don't. They're not looking at it as, as a gray area when it comes to how to heal the sick or when it comes to how to heal God's voice or when it comes to learning to forgive somebody, practicing to forgive somebody mm. or practicing to love somebody. It's, 
it's just something you 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 get you do and you and you, and you know that there's going to be failure involved because it's not practice unless failure is involved. So there has to be failure involved right. because you don't need to practice if you're successful every time because you're just going to keep doing it every time uh, perfectly. But it, practice is because you are going to fail, and every time you do it, you're going to fail less, and you're going to get better at what you do. Uh, when it comes to healing the sick, when it comes to ministering the gospel, I mean, you you just get into this place where it's okay to fail and when you're when you when you've arrived to that place where you know it's okay to fail in god's eyes uh because you're just practicing uh, it takes all the weight off of you and it's easier for you to 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 be successful at what you're doing because you don't get to that place where you get discouraged and want to quit and if people saw it that way, there would be less people quitting and more people per, uh, persevering. Mm. So that's why um, it says, uh, consider it all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials for the testing of your faith produces endurance so that you may be lacking in nothing. Mm. James, yeah. And it just makes you stronger when you see it that yep. way. When you just keep going and you and you account for failure, that you know that everything is not going to work perfectly, that sometimes you're going to minister to somebody on the streets you're going to have a conversation you're going to talk with people or you're trying to develop a relationship and then you make a mistake in the, in the relationship and the person gets angry at you or uh, you offend them and then you go all right i'm going to learn not to do that again mm. i'm going to learn how to say this differently so i don't get such a visceral visceral reaction from them and 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 you just learn uh, because you're human and and god understands that he's not putting a demand on you that you've got to do this thing right that's only the enemy doing that, mm. making you think it's that's, God. That's crucial. That's important there. So, yes. Yeah. Yes. Definitely. So uh, practice is, is how I view a lot of things. Uh, I remember, um, so when it comes to healing the sick, what I tell people is that one of the key factors in getting healing to happen is that you've got to do it repetitively in a short amount of time. If you're going to really see a lot of power flowing out of your hands when you pray for people, you've got to pray for people almost on a daily basis. And, and the best way I can describe what I mean by that is like going to the gym and working out. If you only go and lift weights once or twice a week, you're not going to see many gains no. when it comes to making muscle. Nope. You're just yep, not. You're right. You have to do it every day or every other day. And you got to you got to keep going at it. You got to keep lifting weights, keep lifting weights. And and the best way I can only describe it is is like there the Holy Spirit lives in us and it is the, the power of the Holy Spirit wants to flow out of it out of us, but there is a blockage. Mm. There's a blockage, and that's unbelief. And the more you 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 pray for people, or the more you lift weights, the more that blockage starts to starts to get cleaned out. And uh, it's like a hose. Like if you had a hose and there's a, a buildup on the inside, if you turn the water on, you just see like a trickle of water that's coming out. Well, if you keep that on, eventually it, it'll erode the inside of that blockage. Because it'll just slowly, slowly push the buildup out of the way. Because the water is constantly passing through mm. it. Constantly. And so the more you do it, the more the stream will start getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But that's because the water is constantly flowing again and again and again and again. But if you, take, if you turn the water off, well, then the buildup will just start to close itself down. And then there'll be less of a flow, a hole for a flow. And so it's like the same thing in us. If you just take a break from healing and you don't do it like that, uh, it'll, it'll just start to close up again. Mm. And, and it's because it's a place of unbelief where you start living from. If you're not exposed to, to, uh, to doing something and activating something, doing a kingdom act like that, right. um, 
it starts to close up. It just does that in everybody. And I think a lot of people will say, well, I've been praying for healing for years. I've been doing it and I haven't seen healing happen. And what I say to them is, well, when, when you, when you say that you're telling me that you pray for people whenever there's a prayer request and then you pray from your prayer closet for healing. Well, and then there, and then the occasion you'll lay hands on the person. Right. But what I'm saying is, is that the most effective that I've seen is not when you pray for people at a distance. That's to me the least effective. Okay, I was going to ask you about for, that. For that's healing. interesting. Yeah, keep going. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say that's the least effective. The most effective is to be in the physical proximity and laying your hands on them. That's the most effective way. Um, and it's the most effective way to increase the power in you. So if you keep doing that again and again and pray for the people in your house. Pray for your friends. Pray for people at church. Get involved in the healing team at church so you can just get lots of practice mm. in it. And I'm not saying you have to do it every single day, but if you could pray for somebody at least um, three to four times a week or pray for people laying on of hands, just doing that, I guarantee you, you will start seeing healing eventually when it happens. And in the beginning, you're not going to see people getting healed. Uh, in the beginning, you have to get over the uh, the common challenge of healing not happening and the demonic talking in your head saying, you're not anointed. That guy, Steve, doesn't know what the heck he's talking about. You won't heal the sick. It's not going to happen. Everyone in my friend group back in the day when I was really doing this a lot out on the streets, every one of us could heal the sick. Like there was, there was eight of us. All of us were healing the sick. All of us were having testimonies every day in the grocery stores in the gas stations, out on the street, everybody had their testimonies and we just talk about them. Because why? Because it's not an issue of, do you have the gift of healing? You have the gift of the Holy Spirit right. in you. And that has all the gifts enwrapped yeah. in it. So I'm not saying that there is not a specific anointing on that, uh, on healing, because there's there's different aspects of healing, like having a healing angel with you that is different for, for specific ministry. But... Um, but the thing is, is that the, the the fundamental gift we all have and carry is that we can all heal the sick. We can all do it. It's just that, like I said, too many Christians do half-hearted praying when it comes to healing the sick. And I, like I said, they just don't do it enough. And they only do it in times of crisis. And then they'll 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 talk about, like I said, pray for healing once or twice a month. And they've been doing it for. 30 years or something like that and they think that they've been praying for healing their all of those years and it's like that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about you've got to do this frequently and you've got to do it a lot and and so it was funny because um back in back last year um i mean i i hadn't been doing a lot of prayer for healing i it was just more of, of occasional prayers for healing and all right. that and so when i pray for people i wouldn't see much happening mm -hmm. and um, because I do a lot of deliverance. Right. I'm, I'm doing inner healing and deliverance. That's what I'm mainly focusing on with people for doing all that stuff. But I wanted to start praying for healing again. So I just started to practice, just like I'm telling you, just going out on the streets, praying for people, knowing in my head they are not going to get healed. Going to small groups, praying for people, just saying, yeah, I'm going to pray for you. I'm just practicing right now. And I remember one of the girls go, no, 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 you're not supposed to practice. You're supposed to believe they're healed. I go, no, just trust me. <laughs> just trust me. I will see healing quicker than you will ever see quick see seeing healing coming out of you. And within a week, I was already starting to see healing. Mm. So it took about a week and a half of me praying like that and just doing the method like I'm telling you. And then all of a sudden I would start people would start feeling power coming out of my hands. And then uh we I started getting testimonies of people getting healed. Um and so uh it just like I said in the very beginning. No, I, I knew nothing was going to happen when I pray for people because, like I said, that little that little thing was all clogged up. I needed to go back to the gym, start praying for it, and it just started to ramp up again. And that's all it comes down to. And I'm not saying it's going to be that quick for everybody. Right. <laughs> it's just, I, I mean, I, I've lived in this, this place for a long time. I mean, sometimes it could take a month. You, you're praying for people um, and nothing is happening. But you have to get over that hump that is going to be trying to discourage you from healing and praying for healing and telling you, see, it's not working. It's not working. You're praying for people. It's not working. 
you don't have the gift, you know, and it's pushing past that. You're just practicing, pushing past it. Well, let me ask you this, Steve. Um, you know, there's a passage. Uh, it's actually, I think, in two of the Gospels. It might be in more where Jesus was. I think he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. And then he came down and there was a man who had a son who was demon possessed. And, and the disciples couldn't do anything about it. And he said, this one only comes out by prayer and fasting. And for so many years, people have read that as it like only a demon comes out by prayer and fasting. When I think he was talking about unbelief, what do you think about that? And has fasting helped you eradicate unbelief in your life? Well, so, so in that scenario, I mean, I, I love that passage because there's so much to pull from yeah. that. Um, you, you see, that's a, a good example of practice and people who gave up because they didn't see the healing or the, the deliverance happen fast. Right. And so, so this is why Jesus, you can see, is a little bit bothered by them. <laughs> and he goes, you faithless and perverse generation. <laughs> you know, and he said, this didn't, wouldn't, didn't happen because of your unbelief. He heals the boy right on the spot. So we know it's God's will for them to be healed. They prayed, it didn't happen. So that means God's will doesn't always get accomplished, even though we know something's God's will. Just a good, a good example of God's will not happening when they prayed. It happened when Jesus prayed, though, and Jesus would have would have only said what he said to them if he knew they were capable of doing it. So he knew they were capable of doing it. That's why he said what he said. You faithless and perverse generation, meaning perverse, you're double minded. Mm. Half of your mind's in heaven, half of your mind's in the world. And when you do that, you're unstable in all your ways. And you're just uh, you're just not going to see much breakthrough in your life if you're living so much in the world. Because like what I said, you pray for somebody, it didn't happen. Then all of a sudden, you're going to be bombarded with these thoughts that you're not anointed. You don't have this, the power in you. Quit, 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 quit doing what you're doing. That's what it's trying to do. The enemy's trying to work on you, and you're giving him uh, a, a playground in your head to 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 convince you to stop what you're doing and that you can't do this. So he says, "You're you're faithless and perverse. You you've quit." And he says, "It this the whole thing just it didn't happen because of your unbelief. You 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 guys stopped because you let your mind get to you." And the enemy got to you. And, and that's why you stopped, because this was God's will. You, If you would have kept going, you would have seen the breakthrough. Mm. But further on, he goes, this one only comes out by prayer and fasting, which he was telling you there is a different level of, of demonic power that is going to need more power behind, right. behind what right. you're doing. And I've seen that uh, many times, ministering to people, doing deliverance. I know there, there are Christians that will get on that bandwagon and say, uh, the Holy Spirit. Is, is powerful enough in you and you don't need it doesn't matter how big the demon is it should just go and i'm like going that's because you don't understand again how this works you you're, you're fantasizing in your head about how you think in the spirit realm the power of god flows out of people yeah it, it flows out mm -hmm. in measure yeah I, i've noticed mostly that non-practitioners are the ones that say that i mean i'm just being honest yes oh you know you you are yes the the, the ones you will have the biggest pushback are the ones who don't do this regularly. Yep. I had one, I had that with somebody uh, two days ago and they were telling me how they, they just say, all you need to do is just cast this demon out. That's all you got to do. Just cast this demon out. And I'm going, you, you've <laughs> you're, you're complicating like things. <laughs> yeah. You're, yeah. You're like, I'm like, you have only done like one or two deliverances. And this person is thinking that in my mind, I'm making up excuses for the demon and 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 then I'm I'm just not believing hard enough, and I'm going no, you just not, you haven't done enough of this. And I go, I started out thinking exactly like you, thinking it should go quick, fast, and easy. I never came to the conclusion that that this thing had more power, and that I needed to operate at a higher power. I never had that in my head for a long time. I kept doing exactly what I was doing with you, but I wasn't seeing breakthrough happen. Well, there's two things about that. It, number one spiritual warfare it is warfare it's not spiritual you know easy yes number two we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but we do wrestle against you know i know he uses powers and principalities and and all that but but the but we still wrestle 
with this spiritual realm. And yeah. and because we wrestle with the yeah. spiritual realm, it, it, and see what's happened is Hollywood has over dramatized it, and so everybody thinks, well, it's not like Hollywood, you know, it's not you're not Father Amort who's gonna blah 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 blah, you know, do all this kind of stuff. But then they think, well, so it's he just comes out with a word. They don't realize that Jesus did it different ways, different times, and they always didn't come out just with a yeah. word. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if a person is pushing me on it, then I will go into their record of how long they've done it, how many times. And then if they really even want to become more uh, adamant about their position and they don't want to back down, then I go, all right, let's 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 just put this to the challenge. I have some people I want you to pray over. Why don't we do this? Let's let's we can get on a Skype call or you come in person and you can pray over this person. You can cast this demon out. And I want to see if you can do it. Let's do it. Let, I, let's I want you to put your theology where your faith is. And 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 I want I want you to back up what you're saying right now, and you always see them back down once that happens. <laughs> once once you once you challenge their theology and you and you and you, rather than just talking about it, let's let's go do it. If you think you can do this, if you think you can cast out any demon, let's go. Show show me right now, and they will always back down. Always, you know. If you think you can heal any person, you can pray for any person. They're going to get t- uh, set free. Come on and show me. I got I got five people I know. Who I who I want you to pray over, mm. and uh, and then if if you can prove to me that you can do it your your method, then then uh, then I'll stop talking. But they don't ever want to do it. They don't ever want to do it. They don't. <laughs> yeah, I don't hear from them again. No. They they uh, they they block me or whatever, yeah. you know. Yeah. But um, but like I said, it just it just goes to show these are just people who have read a lot of books. They have listened to too many messages from other people, and then uh, and they've done maybe one or two of these uh sessions with somebody and then they think they're an expert and they're just not they're 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 just talkers yeah so um but going back to uh the prayer and fasting jesus says this one only comes out by prayer and fasting what he's saying he's not saying hey guys let's do a prayer meeting right now and let's fast Mm -hmm. get this sucker Mm -hmm. out jesus was living the lifestyle of prayer and fasting which means if you live a lifestyle of prayer and fasting that means it's it's you living in heaven for a longer period of your day. You're you're focusing more of, of on the things of heaven and the kingdom than you are of the things of the world. So you're going to be less perverse in your thinking, meaning double minded. You'll be less double minded, and the 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 less you're double minded, the more you're going to be able to hear from God. And the more you hear from God, the more you're going to be tapping into that and keeping that flow open regularly and then and then why i like fasting is because fasting really um suppresses your soul it gets your soul uh out of control and it makes your spirit man more in control so the more your your spirit man is more forward because of fasting mm-hmm. the more you're capable of hearing god's voice and connecting into the holy spirit throughout your day that's why it's it has so many benefits it's not a hunger strike like some people you know, misunderstand yeah, it. Twist arms uh, it's not arm. yeah. I, yeah, they want to twist. Yeah, it's like, yeah, and, and that's not what right. it is. It's like I'm not gonna eat until you give me what right, I want. Right. It's, it's not how it yeah. works. It's all about it's all about what's spiritually happening to you. This is why people in other religions do it because they know. Well, they don't. I don't think they even know all, all the dynamics that's going on. It's just that when you get your soul in a sub, a form of submission, it. It, it makes it to where you can have much more control because that's where the demonic uses. They, they use the, uh, your flesh to deter you and derail you and to distract you from things. So when you, are, when you are focused on your needs and feeling good, then you can be controlled too much by your soul. Mm. But this is why fasting is so good because you're suppressing your soul and telling your soul, no, you're not going to get what you want. You're not going to get what you want. You're, I, I'm going to live by the spirit. And that meant, that means that my spirit man is going to come forward. That spirit man doesn't need food. It doesn't need TV. It doesn't need stimulation of any kind. It just wants God. And then when you're giving your spirit man more of God throughout the day, you're going to be more connected to him, which means you're going to hear him way better mm-hmm. because you're not going to have all the clamor and clutter in your head and, and you'll be guided by him much easier. And, and again, the flow of power will be greater and wider. That's why if you're really going to take it to the next level in healing, 
is you pray for people repetitively, like I was saying earlier, but you also live at a deeper level of a lifestyle, a lifestyle of prayer and fasting, not just every once in a while, but you do that. You, you pray every day. You fast every day. You go into the presence. I'm not, okay. I wouldn't say fasting every day. I mean, that could be kind of extreme. Some people do that. Um, but at least maybe like once a week, if you did something like that, had this lifestyle, mm-hmm. it's going to just ramp it up. It's like, it's like putting steroids in, in what you're doing. And so that's where you see the bigger miracles, yeah. the greater miracle. Yeah, cool. And, and the ones who have the testimonies of that in their healing ministry, those are the ones who do that. Yeah. So they combine all. Well, that. let me ask you a question here. Uh, Lindsay, do you have anything you want to ask? Is there anything running around in your heart? Well, I yeah, I just I like that mindset. It seems like the first place people's mind goes when they read that verse and hear about healing and prayer and fasting, we we have this very sort of meeting or session sort of mindset. Okay, we need to have a prayer and fasting session to deal with this. And I right. just like that. No, we just need to make it a part of our life. Yeah, 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 yeah. for your own benefit. It's for your benefit, just to to keep your mind in heaven. If you spent an hour a day in heaven, I mean, just an hour a day in heaven. If, if you God just took you up in the spirit and you went to heaven for a day, you're not going to be like everybody else. Mm-hmm. You're going to think mm-hmm. really different, mm-hmm. especially when you approach problems. Wow. You'll you'll always approach it from a supernatural perspective, like oh, we need to pray and 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 bring God's power into this situation. Rather than, oh, no, wait, we need to call the doctor. Oh, wait, we need to take this or do that. You're just going to be thinking differently. That's what it will do when you are spending more time in heaven every day. You'll become heavenly minded rather than like the way everybody thinks when you just immerse yourself in the world. Well, yeah. And, and the other cool thing about that is, is it, it takes time and a lot of us don't want to you know do the time. But I've noticed that the very area that the enemy tries to attack the most in my life is my secret place. You know, my, my, my secret place, the, like, like you said, the prayer and the fasting, the soaking, the being with him, just the, uh, just the being with Jesus. And that's what he wants to attack. I mean, I give an example. I get up in the mornings, uh, my son, who's a teenager now, and he, he's up all different times of the night. As soon as I get up real, real early, there he is right there. And he doesn't mean anything by it, but there he is right there to distract me. I don't get any alone time, you know, and, and I know I'm not saying my, my son is possessed. I'm just saying the enemy is using that to, to keep me out of my secret place. And that's one of the first areas that, that he attacks that and my unity with my wife. Those are the two main boom yeah. booms that he'll hit with that because he knows yeah. That where we become spiritual powerhouses. If I get my life right and intimacy with him right, the the other pro, you know, yes. the other unity with my wife will come along. And, For and, sure. and so, yeah, he he just loves to to attack that. Well, let me ask you this: Is there somewhere you want to go, Steve? Do you feel the Holy Spirit wanting you to go uh, or attack something else? Because I have a question I'd like to ask if if you if you don't mind. I don't know. Go ahead. Ask. Uh, if if you were going to give a prescription. For somebody new coming into the healing ministry, what what would be like uh, as many as you want to name, like three or four disciplines or three or four actions that they can begin to take, like so as like a fulcrum to begin to to build themselves up uh, to be able to walk in an effective healing ministry. Well, it's like some of some of the things we've already touched yeah. on, um, fasting a. Like, like, like if, if you like the persistence one, uh, understanding what faith is, faith is um, w- when I when I was in Africa, the very first thing I learned was when I remember praying for somebody and uh, it, we were at a, a, he- a crusade. It wasn't a healing crusade, but I wanted to make it into one because <laughs> I was the last speaker on the stage. And I'm saying, God can heal you today. And if you want to come up, come up. And uh, we'll pray for you. And then I get down on the ground in front of the stage. And then all of a sudden, a lot of people come up and I'm going, oh, oh. I'm just thinking maybe like two. <laughs> but they just started lining up in, in, in a big, massive wow. group. And so I, I looked back at the other three people I was with and I said to them, I said, hey, guys, uh, I, I waved to them. I said, get up here. 
I've never done this before yeah. either. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so get your butt up here and let's do this. Yeah, I'm I'm nervous yep. too. So I prayed for the first person, and this lady had certain body pain. Don't remember exactly what it was, uh, but I prayed. 15 second prayer, asked the translator, how is she doing? Translator said, uh, she says it's gone. I said, ask her again to make sure. She says it's gone. I go, what? Is she lying? He said, no. She says it's gone. I'm like, all right, never mind. Let's just go to the next person. <laughs> so <laughs> great for the next person. They got healed quick. And I'm going, what the heck's going on here? <laughs> and then the the third person it was the translator. She wanted healing in her shoulder. I prayed. Nothing happened. Prayed again. I told her to worship Jesus. Why prayed? Because I'm just trying to figure this out. <laughs> and and then all of a sudden she felt hot heat, fire go through her body. And when the, the heat was gone, the pain was gone. So I'm like, oh, wow, you know, crazy. But I was kind of flabbergasted because of my word of faith teaching on faith. Mm -hmm. um, I was asking God, I'm going, why did the first Christian get healed? Or no, the first person get healed when I prayed for them? Because I didn't have any faith, I, I kept questioning, and I was I, I I was stunned that they were healed. I couldn't believe they were healed after 15 second prayer. And and he says, "Well, you 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 did have faith. You prayed for them." Mm. And when he said that, it clicked in my mind what the Lord meant by that. He was saying it wasn't about you feeling that was going to happen. That's not what faith is. Faith has no feelings to it. But we get taught, and it gets conveyed so many times, especially in Word of Faith teaching, that that faith is a feeling. And then they'll say it's not, but then they'll 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 say it with their words and their actions, and and just they don't even realize that they're double talking. Mm. And and they'll say, "I feel the faith rising up inside of me. I, I just oh, I just know God's gonna heal. I just know God's gonna heal them." And they're and it's a feeling. They're they're banking off of the feeling. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they feel confident that it's going to happen. And so they're, they're thinking and confusing that as, as this is what is making it going to happen, make it going to happen. So when I prayed and it didn't happen, or it did happen, I'm sorry, when I prayed and I didn't think it was going to happen, I was just blown away. And, I, and that's where my mind was it was I couldn't understand that healing would have happened when I didn't have the faith. But what God was saying the faith was, was my action. Mm. He said, basically, I could have the feeling that the person wasn't going to get healed. And if that feeling translated into me not praying for the person, then it's unbelief. But I could have the feeling that they're not going to be healed, but I don't let my action, I, I, I don't, let my feelings dictate my non-action, and I pray. That's what faith. All right, is. I say that you need. That you need to say that one more time for the cheap seats. That was so good. Can you say it one more time? Yeah. So, so I can't let my feeling dictate my action. So, if I I can have the feeling that it's not going to happen, but if I let that feeling dictate my actions which would be a non-action then it's unbelief wow so if i let my feelings get me to not pray and to not lay hands on the sick then it's unbelief but i could still have the feeling that it's not going to happen but i can't let it come out of my actions and if i have the feeling that it's not going to happen but i just obey because the bible says to lay hands on the sick and pray and command healing if i just do that that's what faith is. That's what belief is, wow. is when I'm going forward on it. And so it just revolutionized my whole view of faith after yeah. that. Because then it all made sense. It all made sense. Because when you look at like a doctor who has the belief that the, the cure of cancer is out there, you'll hear him say that, like the cure of cancer is out there. And you just keep, keep testing and testing and testing and testing, and eventually you'll find it. So in other words, they have this belief that, that if I just keep doing something again and again, eventually by st statistics, I'm going to uh, have a better chance of finding this cure. And so what we do is that we stop and we 
don't go forward anymore because we we feel like it's just never going to happen. But if you're like this doctor that just keeps going forward and just knows that if I just keep testing this and test this and test this, then eventually I'll find the cure. In other words, the cure is out there and I'm not going to let my actions be dictated with my doubt. I can't let my actions be dictated by my doubt. There were times I believed the person was going to get healed. I felt they were going to get healed and they didn't get healed. And there were times, again, I didn't think they were going to get healed and then they got healed. So again, it's not the issue of whether or not you feel it's going to happen. It's the issue of whether you push forward and choose to do the action that God tells you to do, which is just lay on a hand and pray for the healing. Now, there are other reasons why healing doesn't happen, right. but you need to have that faith mindset, that persistence mindset, which is how I really like to define faith, because I see it like the woman and the judge. I believe that's the best example of faith, is she says, to the judge, uh, give me justice. And he says, no, give me justice. No, give me justice. No, give me justice. All right, woman, you exhaust me. I'll give you what you want. And then Jesus says at the end of that parable, when the son of man returns to the earth, will he find faith? Will he find people who persist after failure? Will they keep doing the action even though they feel it's not going to work? Will they keep doing the action when they even get discouraged? That's what faith is. It's And, and, and it's unbelief when you let your feelings of doubt and fear dictate your actions of not going forward, not doing anything. I, I always like using the Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade scenario of when yep. he is going to. I just thought about that. that yep, yep. I just thought about that. Yeah. So cool. <laughs> <laughs> I, I yeah, I, I love that because that's a perfect example of faith. Uh, he does not see a path to get to the other side. And and he's repeating uh, some phrase over himself about um, about faith, and and so he sticks his leg up and he pushes his leg up into the air and he kind of elevates there for a second and then he moves his momentum forward and then he realizes he hit something mm -hmm. and he's like, what is that? And then he realized it was kind of like an optical illusion and it's a pathway going across. And the thing is, is that. His brain and his all of his feelings were saying, don't do this. This is stupid. You're going to die. You're going to die. But then there was this one thing in him mm. that said, lift up your leg and move your momentum forward. That's what faith was. Yeah. When I was growing up, Steve, I mean, you appreciate this. You're so cow. Uh, I skateboarded and I constantly had to have faith when I dropped in on a, on a half pipe. You know, that's the same kind of kind of yeah. thing and, and i would drop in and i'd bust my butt you know but but i kept dropping in and each time i kept dropping yeah. in eventually i learned how to pump my legs to to be able to you know to do it and i think about that and the indiana jones thing you just said all the time about just and people would call that blind faith but it's not really blind faith because you know what you're getting into there's a difference between exactly. blind faith and that but that it's just like okay i'm putting everything to the side every emotion and i'm just gonna do it just do it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Taking the risk. Yeah. And uh, and so the faith thing is, I believe, is is critical to understand how to do this. I believe it's it's so important to understand what what faith really is. And um, it, you don't have to whip yourself into this frenzy of belief, of feeling that it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to yeah. happen. Like, you know, people are going, you're this, you're amazing. You're this. You're, and you're like, yes, I am. Yes, I am. And I, you're trying to get yourself to, quote unquote, believe what you're saying. You don't have to do that. You just got to do what he tells you to do. And and even if you're fearful and you don't think it's going to happen, but you, you just still push yourself forward and you're going to do mm. it. You don't have to have all these feelings that you're going to be, um, that, that it's going to work out. You just got to just do what he says to do. That's what faith is. Mm. And uh, um, it's taking that risk. And, no, if, and, and like I said, you don't have any of the surety in yourself that it, or in God, in God and every, well, you're, you're, you're trusting that God is going to do it. Right. You know, you're trusting that, you know, even even if I make a mistake, you're going to fix my mistake. Yeah, that's what you're doing. 
I say I say that God factors in our stupid. That's what I tell people all the time. I don't know where I heard it, but it's like he yeah. he's so great. He even factors in my stupid. Yeah. Well, let me let me exactly. let me switch gears, Steve. Only if it's okay with it. Uh, let's talk a little bit about emotional healing and and stuff like that. Uh, do do you have? I don't want to go into the intricate details of SRA and DID and and all that kind of stuff. But but do you have like a? Uh, and and we're really big about creating things that are simple that everybody can do instead of being a specialist. I I, I don't want to be a specialist. I want to recreate myself. So do you? have like a, a way of healing emotionally that uh, that you, can be done even practice. I mean, it can be more than one session, but it but could start really relationally just, you know, like having coffee with somebody or, or just praying with somebody, you know, on the fly, so to speak. Emotionally. Yeah, be- yeah. Right. Because there, there's, there's some things that need to get dealt with in, in, in more of an intricate way. Um, but I think a lot of times people try to deal with some of their big issues in a more intricate way, or even their small issues in a more intricate way, which means just getting a demon cast out or sessions, um, get, doing inner healing. Right. Uh, but there's a lot of there's a lot of areas of our life that don't need that, and that and, and even those things won't work for what needs to really be done. What really needs to be done is specific areas of mind renewal. And mainly in their theology. Okay. Yeah. This is why I will spend a lot of time talking with somebody and getting them healed in many areas of their life by sitting down, having a conversation with them, finding out what they believe. Not just going into their past, but I want to go into what they've been taught throughout their life with God. That's really practical. I want to start dealing with their image of God. That's the number one thing I always want Mm. to go after with every person. Mm. I want to find out how they believe about God. Because to me, that is where all healing really lies, is that the reason why we have so many wounds is because we have walls up towards God that we don't realize that are there. And the reason why we have these walls up is because we believed lies in certain areas with God throughout our life, throughout our childhood, that we don't realize that we've put, uh, we've made decisions about who God is and his character and his nature, and we've pushed it down, and we keep it down in inside of our soul, and we don't realize how much it affects us from getting breakthrough in so many areas of our life. And then the second thing is, is our image of how we see ourselves. Mm. So, I want to sit down with somebody like there's somebody recently who wanted me to just do a lot of deliverance and deal with uh, soul fractures and a lot of childhood trauma, which they have and which they're going to need. But I have been trying to convey it to this person that that is not going to take care of the immediate problem right now that I see is a problem in your life. And, and, and the number one problem that you have is your image of how you see yourself and God and how you see God. And I, I, I can already hear it in the way you talk to mm. me. I can already see that there are things that you need to basically change your thinking on. Because if you don't change your thinking on these specific things, it, I don't care how much deliverance you get, you're still not going to get free of what you're dealing with right mm. now. How much inner healing you're, you're still not going to get free right now. And it, it'll, it'll even make the inner healing and deliverance hard to do because of these factors that I see that are really apparent right now by by the language you're using, by some of the things you're saying, I can see that you need to have your, your thinking challenged. Because at the end of the day, the whole point of all deliverance and the whole point of all inner healing is to deal with our mind, the way we yeah, believe. It's mind renewal. That is the whole goal. Yeah, it's, it's, it. it's Romans 12 too. And the, you know, the other thing I, I encounter, and Sandy and I have encountered in our ministry doing that, is like, I'll give you an example of a false belief that just, it, 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 if they have this, you can't even get off the ground, off the ground floor is if, if they're, right. if they're of a certain persuasion, which, which usually I'm going to say a denomination, but I love this. I love the people. I love the body of Christ. But if they're like Presbyterians, a lot of times they have this very iconoclastic viewpoint of images. And so one of the first things that, I mean, if you can't get them to close their eyes and see Jesus, cause they think it's idolatry, boom. You know, you can't even get off the ground floor. Exactly. You have to challenge that belief. That uh, exactly. Yeah. 
So, so to your question about what I do to that, that's the quickest way of doing things. I sit down and I talk with mm. them and, but, but you have to know what to really deal with in their thinking. Uh, that's why I, that's why I say it, it's important that we really check our theology yeah. and we really understand what we believe about God's nature and about how we see ourselves. If you have a lot of shame, guilt, uh, false humility, um, uh, you don't see yourself in, in the in the the light that God sees you. It's going to be hard for you to help people because you're just going to perpetuate their problems if you haven't changed that in yourself. So, uh, like I said, th- there's a lot that needs to change in one's thinking because at the end of the day, that's really what we're going after. Right. When I'm working with an SRA person, at the end of the day, I'm trying to get parts of their system to change their belief system. Mm -hmm. That's what the goal Mm -hmm. is. I want them to know that God is actually a good God and that he loves them and he he has not forsaken them and that he wants to help Mm -hmm. them and that they're not garbage and that they're, they're not, uh, they're not uh, invaluable or unvaluable. Um, and, and so I want them to understand these things, but I have to break through a lot of the demonic garbage that can get in the way, which I have to do deliverance. So, I, so I have to do some pr- prayer methods to get them out of the way so they can really hear and, and uh, understand this. Because like I said, um, it, it's about the person's thinking. And this is why Jesus said the cure for everything is you shall know the truth and the truth will set you Boom. free. Yep. That's the cure for everything. So all of the methods and everything that we're doing is trying to go towards that goal in those two specific areas. For all human beings. Well, and, and this is this is the truth. This is the truth. I mean, you can work spiritual gymnastics with your Bible. I, what cracks me up, man, is people who come and say, "Oh, God doesn't speak today; He only speaks through the Bible." And then you go and look in the Bible, and everywhere in the Bible, He's speaking outside the Bible. So, which is it? You know, I mean, yeah. Exactly. yeah but but let me. I have. Uh, if you, if you're all right with this, we probably need to land this plane pretty soon. But but I want to give you two scenarios, and and I am interested in hearing how you would handle them. Is that okay? Okay. Sure. Uh, the first one is someone comes to you and they were raped as a child, man, woman, uh, sexually assaulted, and they say, "Well, you know, God didn't stop this." What what would you? How would you respond to that to change their to to renew their mind about that? I would say, so for them, I would say, I understand what you're going through. Um, I'd be really um, uh, empathetic and I would uh, get them to understand, uh, you know, that that was such a horrible thing they'd gone through. Now, I would also say you came to me and, and what I'm going to tell you is going to challenge yeah. you. But what I want you to understand is that when I when I talk about the image of God, the most important thing is that Christians need to understand is the theology that God is not in total control. Mm. And then I will go into that long spiel of the sovereignty stuff yeah. of explaining why God is not in total control. Not that because he's not, doesn't have all power and all authority and all that it's, but explaining how all of that, that God possesses works within the system of planet earth. Right. And so they need to understand, because again, my goal is I want them to have a, the, the right view of who God is, because that's where the freedom is. So that's part of the reason why they're having so many problems is because it was built off of that incident or in other incidences that compounded over the right. years that God forsook them, didn't care about them when they were in their most painful place. Mm. And I'm saying, no, 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 no. What I'm about to tell you is I'm going to give you the argument that he is that he always wanted to help you and he did not like that that happened. He wanted to stop that, but he legally couldn't stop right. that. And he he would if if certain things were it would have been in place, then yes, he could have. But you have to understand he cannot do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. And and so I just go into that whole explanation, uh, and there's a lot to explain of, of taking scripture passages and get them to understand uh, how God is functions and works, and that you, when you take say Romans nine, which is the Calvinist Bible, uh, is, is that chapter, and they explain the entire Bible through Romans nine, rather than using the entire Bible to explain Romans nine. Right. That yes. God is the potter and we are the clay 
uh, who is the clay to say to God, you know, why did you do this this way? All that that chapter is saying is that God has omnipotence. He has all power. We need to know that. We need to know that God possesses that. But what we need to use the rest of the Bible for with plenty of scriptures is that God regulated that power. Yes. He has regulated his own omnipotence. So humanity can have free will. We need to know that. And people need to understand that he just cannot use his omnipotence anytime he wants to do it because of the laws of free will that he implemented within the universe. Well, and two, and two he, he limited himself to free will. People don't realize this, okay? I was talking to a guy the other day. If everything is already predetermined out, like, and I'm going to use this word and they hate this, but this is what it is, fate, okay? Fate actually becomes God yeah. instead of God. God no longer has any freedom or control because he is limited to what is already preordained. So that makes God, yes. that makes him not uh, omnipotent. So the only way yeah. he's truly omnipotent is if he has free will and we have free will. And a lot of people phys- philosophically don't think about that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 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 Exactly. So, so that's what I would really really say to that person and 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 honestly when i when i've had to say it to to many people like that yeah. they it click and it actually creates so much freedom for them so many people have gotten a great deal of freedom it doesn't mean that they they they, they were healed from the trauma right. but they were healed in the area where they had walls up towards god which is the most critical thing that we need to do in all healing is the whole point of why we got to strip down these negative views of who god is in their thinking yeah. is because they created these internal walls that block the block god from being able to come and minister to them throughout their entire life. That's why a lot of them don't feel the love of God. And they're mm. like, why do this, this person feel, feel God's love? Why don't I feel God, God's love? I just don't ever feel his love because you didn't realize unconsciously you'd made walls through your childhood, through, through your teenage years, through your Christian life that have blocked God from being able to, to uh, minister that way to you. And so that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to remove these barriers that they created. God never created any walls. He will never put up a wall between you right. and me. Only we do it. So the demonic strategy is to get you hurt and then try to get you to believe that God either caused it or allowed it. Meaning God, he, he, he could have he chosen not to do this, but he chose to do it so you can go through a hardship and you can learn pain and and then grow from it, which is always the typical Christian response. Yeah. We all know that a six month old, you know, with cancer glorifies God. I mean, anyway, yeah. I, I'm, I'm exactly. sorry. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. And that that's where that's where we have to really be blunt and, and and throw these things out there that because they're so destructive when we when we preach this stuff to people. When pastors get up on the podium and preach these things and use this cognitive dissonance yep. and 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 throw this out to the public and it defames who God is. It just yes. it, it destroys the image to people and people don't want to be with a God who is is um fo- is, is so foolish. He's sounding. a monster. Yeah. Schizophrenic. He's, he, I'm a God of love, but at the same time I like to do stuff like this because this is the only smart way of He doing becomes it. he, he becomes an change. oriental despot. That's what one of my favorite philosophers says about him. He's an oriental despot. So uh Yeah. Uh, Lizzie, you have a question that you were going to ask? No, I was just going to say, man, we, unless God calls in the tanks for every single bad thing that happens, we, we accuse him of not caring. But if we did do that, we would, it's like you said, we would think he was a monster. So yeah, we get, yeah. we hit God with this sort of catch 22 thing, I think all the time. And mm-hmm. we're, we're very unfair sure. towards him. Yeah. Well, my sure. next scenario, Steve, is this, and, and this is this is hitting pretty home, home with me. Um, uh, when someone dies that like a lot of people have prayed for, I mean, there's so many factors involved in this. But but how would you minister? Because I have a guy right now who is really struggling with this faith that a lot of good meaning Christians prayed for this man to live, and he died, and he's like, why bother? You know, why bother praying? So how would you? In a in like what you're talking about in a mind renewal sense, how would you handle that? So this is where I, 
have to get Christians to to take a step back and realize that Western Christianity is very detrimental mm. to it's going to be detrimental to a lot of things in our life, and it's going to create so many problems for when seri- scenarios like this come up, and they're not going to have a real good answer. And the problem is, is because they are not understanding that that you you cannot do half of the things Jesus said to do and see all the things he said you'd see. It just doesn't work like wow. that. When you when you read Jesus's words in 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 scripture, he's talking about how to get your life transformed. And and it's not about how to get saved and go to heaven. Right. You, you, when he talks about the kingdom of God, he's telling you how to walk at this different higher level mm-hmm. of, of Christianity. Eternal life. And and you are going to, to, to go down this path. That's why he says, narrow is the gate or broad is the road of destruction. Right. Narrow is the road. He's not talking about how to get to heaven. I know Christians always use that script, those scriptures to think that only few people are going to be saved. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about entering the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And and, and Jesus has so many verses in scripture where he's referring to kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. It's not about how to get into heaven. You get into heaven by grace through faith. You don't get into, into the kingdom. You don't get into heaven by becoming like a child. If you want to enter the kingdom of God, you become like a child. You want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you become like a child, meaning you need to be more teachable. Mm. You need to be, learn how to trust more uh, so God can start actually filling you up and teaching you and, and growing you to the greater to, to the, the greater level of walking with the Lord. So when you look at Jesus's commandments, it's not to maintain your salvation like so many Christians classically think yeah. like, or, 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 to, or to be saved. You are saved by grace through faith. Not any so so it would none of these verses would make any sense about maintaining your salvation because you're not saved by works you're saved by grace through your faith you believed on Jesus Christ and that's what got you in Amen. heaven. <laughs> but the problem is, is that most Christians do not they'll look at healing like I I've had to change my view of getting your heart healed uh, uh, or getting inner healing. It's not just dealing with the junk in your past. It's dealing with the false beliefs inside of you. Like we've been talking about your image of God and how you see yourself. And if you don't change those things, you're just not going to walk in a deeper level with God. Mm. You do these things. I, I believe everybody needs healing. Everybody needs their heart healed because you never had, nobody had the perfect childhood right. and nobody had the perfect um, uh, grade school experience and, and middle school experience and high school experience. Mm-hmm. So there's trauma through all, all, all of our life through that time, um, some more than others. But we all have it, and, and we know it because we can, you can see the wounds in a person. You can see it in their offenses. You can see it in their lack of ability of, of the Spirit of God flowing through them. Uh, you know, they have the Spirit without me- they, they Jesus had the Spirit without measure. We have the Spirit with measure. You see it in in the sickness in their body that they have. Their body is breaking down. You start to see the death process overtaking their body. Um, you you they have allergies. They have all of these things that you're not supposed to be having as a Christian. That's not the kingdom life because they, it, there's no sickness in heaven. Right. And and in your and you're bringing the kingdom of heaven. It, it's it's on earth, and you're you're believing or you're 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 living in a place that doesn't have all that stuff existing and 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 depression and fear and all of those areas that we we tend as tend to as christians to walk in um and and the problem is is that we have this christianity that gets taught to us that it's all about going to a meeting once a week and then then just going back home going to a meeting once a week amen five songs 45 minute teaching and then we repeat that (laughs) week after week and that that's our goal as christians it's like if you live that life, you're, you're, Jesus never said to live this life anything anything close to that, and 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 to be the epitome of what you were called and put on this earth for. You were called and put on this earth to to attend a meeting once a week. That's not what this was about. You were you were put on this earth to help change it. Amen. To help be a part of it and to live your life for it. Not not go after your nice house, nice car, nice family, good retirement sort of thing. And we Christians 
we want all the benefits of the kingdom, but we don't want to make the sacrifices for the kingdom. The responsibility of the kingdom. We don't want to give yeah. up certain things. Yeah. And so, so what what happens when it comes to somebody or something, a tragedy happening in your family going on, or somebody dying, and, and you're going, God, what's happened? We prayed. We did what you said. Well, when I was asking God, why doesn't healing happen? It, it took about a year, and I finally got the answer, and the Lord said to me, he goes, for a lack of knowledge, people perish. Mm, that's good. For a lack of knowledge, people perish. And and, and when you look at that, that passage, if they would have had the knowledge, they would have used the knowledge to keep themselves from perishing, but they didn't. And it wasn't God's will. God didn't take them out. They didn't perish because of God. They perished because they didn't have the, the knowledge. And then it says in the next part of that verse, because they rejected the knowledge, they rejected the knowledge. The knowledge would have been given to them, but either their religious spirit was too strong or they didn't want to believe. They didn't want to have to change their theology. They wanted to believe their theology was correct all the time. And it was, you know, it was flawless. Right. And they didn't want to have to unlearn something and then learn something new and be taught something. And so God couldn't give them the knowledge. Therefore, they could be praying all they want and asking God for help, but they've already made their decision. I know sometimes there are time where scenarios where you have a church that is praying only out of crisis, and then once the crisis happens, it's already too late. The person most likely is going to yeah. die. Yeah. Because they're not do, they're not living the lifestyle that Jesus said, lifestyle of prayer and fasting, and all the things that Jesus was saying about how to enter the kingdom of heaven. They 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 want to live their life, their American dream lifestyle, and then they expecting all of the benefits of that lifestyle to just to, to happen for them whenever they need it. It doesn't work like that. Jesus never modeled it. He never taught that that's how it would work. But we we just think it should work that way because we see all the leaders, the pastors live that same exact lifestyle. And we see millions of other Christians live that lifestyle. So we go, well. 20 million can't be wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes, they sure mm -hmm. can be Absolutely. wrong. Absolutely. It's a logical it fallacy. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, so the thing is, is that we, then we blame God for why God didn't do it. Mm -hmm. But the blame is on us because it's clear in scripture what we're supposed to do, but we let the masses determine truth to us and the true lifestyle of the way we're supposed to live. Wow. And, and so we, we look at it like that and we just go, well, God, you failed me. He didn't fail you. There, there were God. God will call everybody to live outside of that American dream lifestyle. And, and I'm not saying God doesn't want us to ever have a nice house, nice car, nice family. Right, right, but right. there is the perspective that Jesus was very clear that when he he said that you must hate your 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 mother, your child, your husband, whatever. He wasn't saying hate them. He was saying like less, meaning put them lower on the priority scale than right. God. They need to be put on the, the priority scale lower than than your relationship with yeah. God. God has to be first, even over your own child. Yeah. And if you want if you want the amazing life for your family and for yourself, put God above everything. Wow. That's why he said, "He who puts his hand on the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God." It didn't mean you were not going to go to heaven if you don't renounce your family. Mm. That's not what he was saying. He just said, if you're going to live the lifestyle of the benefits and the favor. And the power of God to destroy the works of the devil in you and your family's life. You've got to put God before them. You've got to put God and your needs and desire or your desires and everything before. Uh, you've got to put God before all of those things. If you're going to really watch the kingdom of God manifest in your life to the way Jesus said, you've got to put him first. And it, which means you've got to make some sacrifices. Because again, it's not about going to heaven. You're saved by grace through faith. But if you want, I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to enter the kingdom of God, because if you look at scripture, it's, it's, it's not saying that you're in the kingdom of God because you are a Christian. You are, in, you are in, you are a child of God because of your faith through grace, mm. but you have not entered into becoming a son of God, a huyas of God. A, and, and walking in the kingdom just because you said yes to Jesus. And that's why you see so many Christians, millions of them, living a depressed, fruitless life. They're going to heaven one day, but they have sold themselves short on 
the benefits that has been provided to them by the finished work of the cross. Mm. The finished work, you don't get the finished work of the cross by believing you have the finished work, by saying, I have the finished work and, and using that mantra in your head. Right. It, it comes on by you following what Jesus said to do, by being obedient and making sacrifices. Deny yourself, pick up your cross. That's how you enter the kingdom of God and walk this life. And I mean, I'm talking about this life that I only see few people live. Yes. Yes. I wouldn't even say that I fully live in it. My goal is to fully live in it, like Paul yeah. did, where Paul just you would see miracles right and left. Now, I see miracles, but I, 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 I come in contact with the kingdom of God. I come in contact with the kingdom of heaven. I, I, I see fruit of it, and I, and, I, and I don't live from depression, and I don't have it. But I know there's even more for me out there in this. I can go deeper in this. We can all go deeper in this and experience God and the power of God where there's healings that just happen. You don't even have to pray at times Mm. because you're living at such a healed, mature level in your walk with God. And it's all available to us. I believe there's a place where if you get so healed, it slows down the decaying process in your body. Because Jesus, when you looked at him, his, his body was not decaying when it was in the tomb. Why? Because there was no sin in him. He got so clean. He was so clean and so whole that the death process couldn't even start in Jesus. That's why he had to take his body or it'd still be around today. And then some people, if you look in history, they lived so long. Some of them, it was recorded, they lived two to 300 years, Some, some saints, but they really lived for the kingdom. They were just not, well, I'm a Christian. I'm gonna go uh, I'm going to go to church once a week and, you know, read my Bible through the week. And and no, they live for the kingdom. They live for him. They didn't live for themselves. Mm. They spent hours in the presence of God because they wanted the presence of God. Yeah. And 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 see, I, I've been through, I would say there's been four phases in my life of transformation and growth. And I in this last phase back in 2021 was the Lord saying some I, I, because the, the phase, that third phase before that was God doing a lot of inner healing on me. And, and me learning it and and how to do it. And I learned I learned it for other people, but I also learned it for myself and doing a lot of junk on uh, dealing with my own yeah. stuff. And um, and then I, the healing process still begins, but at another level and with intimacy. So this fourth phase with me back in 21, 2021, the Lord says, now we're going to go into that deeper realm of the spirit with just me and you. I'm going to take you into the wilderness. And the wilderness is not a place of trial and tribulation. The wilderness is a place of seclusion between with you and God and no other people around. Mm. It's just the wilderness. There's nobody in sight. It's just you and God. And that's where you find him at the deeper places in the spirit. And, and that's always been my heart, my goal for, for years. And God has just been preparing me more and more because I, I want to live that, that, that kingdom lifestyle. That is even greater because I live it, but I, but I, I know there's so much more of a potential of going so further in it. Out of your belly will flow rivers of living Amen. water, uh, life and life abundantly, so your joy would be made full. That's a constant when you wake up in the morning and when you go to bed at night. It, it, and, it, and it's not happening. You're not feeling the joy of the Lord on you because good things are happening in your life. It's just a constant steady flow when you wake up in the morning. And even when something goes wrong, you'll still feel it because you'll know that God will just fix the problem because it's a place you're living from. And like I said, there are miracles and favor, people handing you money, people handing you this or or um, doors just open up and you're like going, man, I don't have to do anything. And, and everything just works out. Healings happen. The, the flow of the fire just pours off of you because you're carrying the presence like that. Yeah. That's what happens when you really go and walk with God in that kingdom reality, you know? And so I know you'd ask that one question, but I'm, I'm saying it's a big, broad answer. Yeah, no, that's good. It's, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's an awesome answer. I mean, I, I feel like you got your preach on. I don't want to stop you, but uh, yeah. Um, we're probably going to have to wrap it up, but I, I do have two more things that uh, the first, first one is, you walk naturally supernatural. I mean, it, it, of, a, of a lot of the people that I know, I mean, you, like you said, you don't do it perfect, but you are striving towards that perfection of walking in the kingdom like a child, walking in the kingdom like a young man, walking in the kingdom like an elder, and you are doing that. So I, I want to ask this. We ask this usually of our new guests, but I want to just ask you because I know you have a story. 
what is the most supernatural thing you've seen the past few months as as you've been walking naturally supernatural? Past few months, I uh, had an angelic encounter. Um, <laughs> yep. Uh, and it was basically, um, I was praying. Well, I woke up in the morning and uh, I was thinking about this book that God wanted me to write. And I'm going, I, I, I just normally don't think like that. And it was just the first thing that came to my mind. I'm like, writing, write the book. You've got to write the book. And, and in my mind, I have okay, all these little obstacles in my head of keeping me from writing the book. But I'm not, I, I have all these ideas of which books to write. Do I write books on this, write books on that, right? You know, but um, so later that day, I was uh, praying with somebody. And then all of a sudden, I, I didn't tell them anything when it happened. All of a sudden they go, what the heck? There's an angel standing right next to you. And then I can feel this, this, this angel right next to me. Mm. And, um, and the angel was looking down at me and he had little like bifocal glasses on his nose and he, and he's looking down at me and, and he's like kind of intently looking like, like he's scribing something. Right. And uh, like, yeah, what are you, what are you, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> Question, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm wait, waiting for you to write your book. <laughs> now, the good thing was, I only felt that I didn't say anything. The person heard that audibly, the angel say that. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, so see, if I could have heard that, then I could have said, well, that could have been manufactured in me. The person saw it as well, and they heard the angel say that. And then I told them after what I was hearing in my head in the morning. Yeah, that's so. In that's other words, incredible. God is like, yeah, God is just like really trying to get me out of my own head of like questioning. I need to, you know, just start start writing the book because in my mind I can go, everything needs to be in order and I got to get it right. And I got it. It's got to be like this. And, you know, sometimes you can get, in, get into that mode and not just trust and just, just do it and just let God start directing how you do something, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, well, Steve, thank you. Um, well, yeah, that was, that, I, that was yeah. an incredible experience. I mean, particularly yeah. since you didn't yeah. hear it yet. Yep. There's no doubt. There's no doubt what you need to do now, Steve, and I will buy that book and I will promote that book. I promise you. Um, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, yeah. before we go, Steve, uh, will you pray for Lindsay and I, but just pray for our listeners as well. Um, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah. So father, I just thank you Lord for Lindsay and Brandon. And I thank you father for what they are doing with this God, opening up the hearts, opening up the minds of people who are hungry and hungry for more Lord, because people that are listening to something like this. They're not wanting to just do church as usual. They're not wanting to just punch in and punch out, Father. I just speak, Lord, that you give the listeners their fill. I just speak, Father, that um, through the people that come on this program, through the things that were said today, God would inspire them, Lord, to, to go deeper with yes. you and inspire them, Father, to push past the barriers that they have felt have hindered them in going further with you because lord you have a calling on their life father you have a destiny on their life and it's not to 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 fill a seat on sunday father you have a destiny on their life to help be the change on this planet to help transform these lives of the broken of the lost of so many out there who just need a god encounter i ask god that through this god more will grow deeper will grow further i just ask god for the fire Lord, to and the anointing to be on them from hearing this and just even hearing my words right now. I just release God fire, whether people can hear it or, or feel it or not feel it. I just speak, Lord, that the fire falls on them right now. Let it fall on them, Father. I just speak, Lord, invigorate that calling, invigorate those old prophetic words, Lord, that have been buried yes. and that those words have, uh, have, have been hidden. Or, or have they felt discouraged and felt like it wasn't going to come to pass? Father, I just speak, Lord, bring that up into their thinking. Bring that up into their mind, Lord, the old prophetic words. And just remind them that those are still in play. Mm -hmm. 
they're still in play and that you want to accomplish your will through them and that they are not disqualified from what you have called been what you have called them to be and what you've called them to do i just speak father that you will put that fire in them and that you will start opening up the doors for them to walk in that will lead them into those prophetic words. I just release that, God, right now in Jesus' name. Increase the fire, increase the anointing, Lord, for the commission of the times that we're living in, for people who are going to encounter danger, for people who are going to encounter adversity and persecution. Father, I just speak, Lord, that the, 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 the believers, the listeners, God, are going to take this walk more seriously, Lord, so they can keep their head afloat and they can keep themselves safe in the times where the enemy wants to take them out because they seize the calling and the destiny on their life and they, the enemy does not want them to, to walk in the things that he knows will destroy his kingdom. So I just release that word over them in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 That's great, Thanks, man. man. Thank you so much. This has been an honor, Steve, to have you yeah. on the show. I appreciate it. It's been an honor again. for me. Yeah. Thanks for listening and supporting us. And remember, stay naturally supernatural.